What's going on engineers? This video is on the Linux file system optimized for humans. Specifically what we're going to examine is all the folders in the root of the file system along with what you might find in each folder and then some of the special files that you're likely to come across. Let's get to it. When we're talking about the root of the file system, what we're describing is the root mount point and that's going to be just slash cd forward slash. If you're coming from Windows, you're probably wondering, well, where's the C drive or the D drive, E drive, F drive, and so on. And Linux doesn't do like named drives like, like Windows does. The other thing you probably notice is that it's all forward slashes, whereas in Windows, it uses backslashes for everything. So let's check out what's in here. So this is all the contents of the root folder. There's a number of folders in the root folder, and we're going to cover a lot of these. There are a couple that are specific to my distro that we won't cover, so we're only going to cover the common ones that are common across Linux as a whole, and it's going to be these ones here that we're going to look at. The first folder to look at is going to be slash bin. This is going to be a folder that contains common executables. They're going to be shared uh, for everyone on the system, whether that's normal users or administrative users. So we'll go to cd slash bin. We'll do ls, and many of these are just extremely common, you know, like cp for copying a file, you know, rm for removing a file, rmdir for removing a directory, and so on. Regardless of the user type, everybody can access all of these. The next folder is slash boot. That's going to contain the actual Linux kernel as well as some of the boot configuration. So if we go into cd slash boot, we look in here, we see things like the initial RAM disk images, the actual compressed Linux kernel, and then the grub folder. Inside the grub folder, you get several more files that are related to the actual booting of the system, and one in particular is going to be grub.cfg. That will let you configure what shows up in your list of kernels to select from as you boot your system. And then if you were to dual boot with Windows, you would actually see a Windows entry inside there as well. One last note about the initial RAM disk and the actual compressed kernel is that in the root directory, you can see that there are two symlinks. One is the initrd.img and then the other one, and those are symlinked to the RAM disk and the compressed kernel. Next folder is slash dev. That's going to contain files which point to both physical and pseudo devices. Keep in mind that on Linux, everything is a file. So there's even files that point to physical hardware, and we'll see an example of that in a second. So we're going to look at one example of each. We're going to look at one file that points to a physical piece of hardware and one that is a pseudo device. So we'll go into slash dev, and on my system I have a total of four hard drives, and that's listed here. SDA is my first one, SDB, SDC, and SDD. Those are actual physical devices, and then the numbers are all the partitions. So SDA has three partitions and so on. So that, that points to the actual device itself. And the B here, that means block device. Now as far as a pseudo device, there's a thing called urandom. And so slash dev slash urandom is a pseudo device that just gives you endless amounts of, of random bytes. So if we use cat slash dev slash urandom, you can see that it just spams endless amounts of randomness. Now in my computer I don't have a physical random you know byte generator so this is simply a pseudo device that that Linux sees as a real device. Next folder is slash etc or some people call it slash etsy. This is going to be the place that you're going to find system and program configuration files. This is true of both user installed software as well like say you do apt install redis it's smart money is going to be that you're going to find the configuration file in slash etc. So you can see here I have I have a Redis folder here. I'll look at what's in there, and I have a, a Redis.conf file, and that's in slash etc slash Redis. And that's true for just about everything. You can see that there's configurations for X11. That's your window manager. There's configurations like I have TeamViewer. So there's configurations for that, and this is going to be the place for all the configuration files for the system. Next is slash home, and when a new user is created in the Linux, they will get a home directory, unless the user was created as a, as a non, you know, as a user doesn't get a home directory. So we can go into slash home, and in my case, there's just one folder called Brian, and that's going to be the, the home directory. 
and these are only for non-root users. That's, that's an important thing. Root has its own directory, which we'll cover in a second. And inside each person's home directory can just be whatever they want to put in there, as well as any configuration that applies to that particular user in their home directory. The next three folders is going to be slash lib, slash lib32, and slash lib64. This is going to be library files are used by the system, and that's going to include things like shared object files, as well as other files. Most of the files will just be found in slash lib, but if there are 32-bit variants and 64-bit variants of different library files, then they can be placed in either of those two folders. The next folder is the lost and found folder, and that's, that's mostly used by FSCK to help recover fragments of files that may have been damaged due to some file system corruption. You, you probably won't ever need to interact with this folder. The next is the slash media folder. Some distros have a, a media folder like this where if you were to plug in, say, like an external USB key, then the system may mount that USB key to slash media slash and then some unique identifier and then let you access it from the system. You could also mount things yourself here, but the better place to do that is going to be the slash MNT folder, which we're going to cover next. So for the slash MNT folder, also called slash mount, that's going to be the place where you're going to mount various file systems, whether that's local disks or network disks or so on. So remember before I said Linux has no concept of like C drive, D drive, E drive, and so on. Well, this is where slash mount comes in. So if you were to buy a new hard drive, say a two terabyte, you put it into your computer on Windows, it might offer that up as like the E drive or the F drive. Whereas in Linux, you have to go into slash mount, create a folder, call it, you know, photos, and then you can mount that drive onto that folder. So you would say, mount my new hard drive on slash MNT slash, you know, pictures. From there, slash MNT slash pictures is in effect your E drive. So let's just examine a couple mounted drives. So if I go into slash MNT and look what's in here, I have three folders, sent, crit, and extra. And these are places where I've mounted actual drives to it and you can use the mount command. I'm going to grab just SD so I can see the actual disks and you can see where these are mounted. So like I have slash dev slash SDC1 and I have that mounted on slash mount slash crit and then I have slash dev slash SDD1 on slash mount slash extra. In effect, SDC1 would be like the E drive, and then SDD1 would be like the F drive. It's just two external disks that I have in my computer that I've mounted onto a folder so I can use them. Next is the slash opt folder. You can use that for really whatever you want. It's for various software. I like to put software that I develop into there that I might be running on like a cloud server, but there's no, there's no special pattern on what you have to use that folder for. On my machine, there's currently nothing in it. Next is the slash proc folder, and this is a very important folder, and this is a virtual file system for system resources and information about processes, along with a couple other things. So if we go into slash proc, do ls-l, we can see a number of different, different things here. And what's in this folder is, first there's a lot of folders, and what this is, is it's a folder for every process on the system. So this is gonna be the actual process IDs here on the right, but there's other files in here as well. There's also crypto, CPU info, consoles, IOMEM. There's memstat, miscellaneous, modules. And these are all things that you can interact with. So some of these are read only, but some of these you can actually put data into. So like for instance, I'll do cat proc uptime. And you can see that it gives me different values as I go. You know, this is a, this is a virtual file that's pointing to the uptime of the system. Remember I said there's a folder for every process, so like remember PID1 is going to be systemd. So if I go to slash proc slash 1, then I get a whole list of files that are specific to that process. And remember, these are all virtual. So if I want to see things like limits, if I want to understand what the limits are for this particular process, I can look at that file and it gives me all the limits for that one process. The next folder is slash root. So this is the root user home directory. You know, uh, root gets its own directory like it wouldn't be in slash home slash root. It's just going to be in slash root. And this is not to be confused with the root directory, which is just slash. It's the thing that has all these folders in it. So slash root is the home directory for the root user. 
Next folder is sbin. This is kind of like bin, except this is going to be executables that are mostly for systems administrators. So if I go into sbin, have a look at all these, we can see things like creating file systems. We can see things like creating, you know, for mounting stuff, looking at IP tables for firewalls, looking at block devices and there's tons of other different things but these are mostly for administrators who are doing some work to the system and not so much for just the normal user next is the slash tmp folder or temp folder and this folder is going to be a place to write temporary files and when i say temporary i really do mean temporary once the system reboots it's going to just wipe out that whole folder so never save any work that you want to keep into that folder but if you want to just put some files in there that are temporary then you know go ahead and do that Next is the slash user folder, and the slash user folder is almost like a mini Linux file system. If we go into the slash user folder, we see a lot of things that we see in the root directory, like bin, etc, lib, sbin, source, and so on. But these are all things that are geared more towards the actual user program and user operations, whereas the other stuff is more like system level. It's also worth pointing out that specifically with, with respect to the bin folder, which contains executables, executables that you put into there by default will override those that are in like slash bin. So if you had an executable called ls in slash user slash bin, it's going to run that instead of slash bin. However, if you have no ls, for instance, in that folder, it will fall back to slash bin. And that, that's all based on your path. By default, the path is set to use slash bin as, as a last resort. The last folder to look at is the var folder, and that's going to be just for variable files. That's just a mishmash of, of whatever you want to put in here. And you, know, you can see there's things like it's a cache folder, backups folder, but there's two things of interest here. One is the log file. So in that folder, there's basically all the system logs that you might have for, for various purposes, like your syslog or your xorg log and so on. And we're done. That's the Linux file system. I know some of it was kind of confusing. Hopefully everybody has a pretty good grasp on what each of these folders on Linux is for. And as always, if you have any questions, you know, put them in the comments below or come chat with me on Discord. Other than that, I will see you on the next video.